All right, we are live. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for our Women in Cannabis Roundtable on 420, the holiday. Hopefully you're enjoying yourself. Be safe, be smart. But if you're watching the replay, please skip a few minutes ahead. And if you're watching the replay as well, or the, the live, let us know where you're calling in from, what vertical you're in, if you're an ancillary business, a cultivator, manufacturer, maybe you're a retailer. And lastly, let us know what you're looking forward to learning today regarding maybe mentorship programs, the political landscape, or anything about future opportunities in the cannabis industry, because questions help us guide the content of this presentation. So drop your questions in to any chat platform that you're on, as well as um, we'll get started here in maybe just about a minute at the top of the hour, we will start for sure. But panelists, thank you for joining today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for having Yes. Nice. Yes. About 30 seconds. We'll get started here. Let the room fill up. We got lots of people joining in multiple platforms. You have YouTube, LinkedIn, as well as Facebook, lots of diverse audience here. So I'm very excited to uh, walk through everything, but all right, it is the top of the hour. So before we get started, I need to let you know that the information contained in this presentation is meant for guidance purposes only and not as professional legal or tax advice and further does not give any personalized legal, tax, investment, or any business advice in general. And with that, I will turn it over to today's moderator, Danielle Gomez from Green Growth CPAs. Thank you, Jim. Uh, first, ladies, I would like to thank all of you for joining us today for our Women in Cannabis Roundtable. We are just absolutely thrilled to have all of you celebrating your 420 with us and are so glad that everyone tuned in to hear from our panelists. So. Today, we are joined by many experienced panelists from a variety of disciplines specializing in the cannabis industry. You can find links to their websites and contact information in the description of the video below, so make sure you check them out. Now, our goal today is to provide a ton of value, have some fun, and help you better understand how women are not only influencing the cannabis space today, but how they're actively changing the negative stigma around cannabis. So we're going to dive into some individual stories. Um, we're going to talk about what's changed in the cannabis landscape as the industry has grown and legalization has increased. Um, and then lastly, today we'll be wrapping it up with some future events, networking opportunities, and ways to get involved with other women in the industry. So our partners have some excellent upcoming events that are designed specifically to help women in the cannabis industry at all stages of their business. So my name is Danielle Gomez. I'm the marketing manager here at Green Growth CPAs, and I will be moderating today's special event. So panelists, thank you for joining us today. We're so honored to have each of you here and very much appreciate you taking the time out of your day to share your experiences, your stories, and your expertise at our inaugural Women in Cannabis Roundtable. Yay! So happy to be here <laughs> and happy 420. Thank you. So I just wanted to briefly go over the agenda and then we'll move over to the introductions of our panelists. So today we're going to have a series of four one-to-one -one chats, as well as some group conversation and discussion on a number of topics. Um, thank you to everyone who registered and submitted your questions ahead of time. If you have any questions that come up during the presentation, like Jim mentioned already, please be sure to put them in the chat. Uh, we've set aside time throughout the duration of the presentation to address your questions and again, time at the end. So our first panelist today is uh, Cheryl Schumann we'll be discussing how the cannabis space has changed over the last two decades. <laughs> We're also going to, it's Cheryl last. <laughs> I was only nine years old at that time. So. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm 29 Cheryl. now. I, 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 I absolutely. <laughs> um, we're also going to be discussing some stereotypes around uh, cannabis usage for women. And we'll be hearing some of Cheryl's personal story and how cannabis saves her life. Um, our second panelist is Safita Artis Mills. Hi, Safita. Hi, Danielle. Uh, Safita will be covering the political landscape. So she'll be talking about upcoming legislation and how the work she's doing is helping women and minorities impacted by the war on drugs, as yes. well as, yes, <laughs> as well as advocating for healthcare needs in the cannabis movement. Um, and our third panelist today is Green Growth's very own. People Operations Leader, Mandy Morton. Hi, Mandy. 
Hi, Danny. Mandy will be explaining how women can find job opportunities in the cannabis space by using their transferable skills. And she'll also be talking directly to operators to help them identify which skill sets their operation could benefit from. Um, and lastly, but certainly not least, we have our fourth panelist, Sarah Falvo. Sarah is the managing director. Hi, Sarah, sorry. Hi, <laughs> hello. Sarah is the managing director of business development with Arcview Consulting. She'll be providing us some insight on how women-owned cannabis businesses can find funding. She'll also be sharing information about some upcoming networking events that you can get involved in specifically designed for women in cannabis. So thank you all for being here today. I can't wait to hear from each of you and discuss your perspective on the current state of the industry and what you think we can expect to see in the future. So we're looking forward to engaging with the audience. So keep your questions coming. Uh, we're expecting a target runtime of about one hour. So without further ado, I wanna go ahead and get started. First, I would like to give each of the panelists a moment to quickly introduce themselves and say hello to our audience. So we'll first start with Cheryl, then Safita, then Mandy and Sarah. So ladies, in one to two minutes, can you please let our viewers know the following? Your name, your company, your business experience. And then lastly, in honor of 420, I want you to give us a quick cannabis knowledge nugget. Something that you wish that you knew in the industry when you first started. Cheryl, let's go ahead and uh, start with you. Can you kick us off? Absolutely. So um, everyone, thank you so much for joining. It's I'm, I'm always pleased when women step up to, uh, you know, making themselves known as a cannabis supporter. Um, for so many years, so many people were in the closet about cannabis, especially women that had careers or were aspiring to have more successful careers. And being a mother, I had two small children at the time, and I had been working primarily with celebrities and getting the vote out all the way back to the 1980s. And then starting around uh, 1981 or so is when I was sharing with my celebrity colleagues and friends and uh, clients, uh, none of them felt comfortable using cannabis or being public with it by back then because they were afraid that they'd get canceled by the studios. And uh, my attitude was always exactly the opposite. It's like, guys, we could hit the grass ceiling if we want to, but we need women. Women are the most successful at building companies. Ask any kind of angel investor or venture capitalist, et cetera. And uh, we were able to bring in so many women. At one point we had 8 million followers on Marijuana Moms. And the primary reason I decided to kind of switch over and use all of my celebrity contacts as well as media contacts, because I've worked with celebrity and media my entire life. Um, I've been in this industry literally all the way since uh, age of 22 and I'm 62 now. So I have four decades and it's like, you know what? I, I, I feel like I just walked out the door yesterday. And uh, even though I have gray hair now, uh, <laughs> a little bit of bleach still there. <laughs> um, I've been very, very pleased by how women have stepped up to the plate, uh, been proud of their activism and those were the first people on the front lines that joined me in building the legal industry. Because when we first started, there was no such thing as legal cannabis at all. It was all in the dark market. And uh, women that had careers were terrified that they would lose their children and have their children taken away from them. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we started gathering these, these small, like one-to-one -one uh, meetings and conversations with women who wanted to break into the business, but didn't know how to get there without uh, fear of losing their children and their jobs and everything else. So that's kind of how it all started. And I can elaborate on the questions that are, um, uh, that came into the uh, uh, folks here. So, and at the end, last but not least, I would just let you know that uh, being a mentor and someone that helps build companies 
If you want to contact me, you are more than welcome to. I sure da- I'm sure that Danny will give you that information. And I want you to know, um, I love seeing women in power and successful because we, as all women, we need it. Uh, it works. And we've changed the course of history. So uh, please feel free to uh, contact me through Danny. Thank you, Cheryl. Very that welcome. was wonderful. Um, okay, let's hear from Safida now. Yes, hi everyone who's watching. Um, I am Safida Artis Mills. I am president and co-founder of the National Cannabis Party. National Cannabis Party is a political party that was established January 26 of 2021 to represent cannabis on a state and federal level to help impact legislation and regulations and ensuring that the industry is fair and equitable for everyone, most specifically for those who have been disproportionately impacted by prohibition and the war on drugs. Um, I have over 10 years of experience in marketing, technology, and gaming. And uh, I started out in the early years of my career in banking. So I've always had a knack for improvement of processes and figuring out solutions to you know issues. I see any problems as opportunities. So being in this industry, there's a lot of things that can be fixed and there's a lot of people who really need to, to for this industry to be fair and, and to have policies in place that protect patients and those to have equal access to medicine. I believe that cannabis um, has so many medicinal benefits that people are still discovering. And I think we've only scratched the surface as to what <clears throat> cannabis can do. I am also a can mom and I am a caregiver. I have a four-year-old daughter who um, is a heart transplant recipient and was born with a severe heart disease where I have been using cannabis for her and it has greatly improved her quality of life. So I'm a huge advocate for cannabis as medicine and for patients because I think sometimes in the conversation when it comes to legalization, even talking about adult use versus, versus medical markets, I feel sometimes patients get lost in the shuffle and forgotten about. So um, I want to make sure that people understand that it is your civil right to choose cannabis as your medicine and to determine what is best for your body when it comes to your health and wellness. So um, that's just a, a small snippet of who I am and what I represent. And I'm so happy to be here with everyone to be able to share as much information as I can. Wonderful, Safita. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. Um, let's see, Mandy, can we hear from you next? Yes, thank you, Danny, and thank you to everyone joining us today. Um, happy 420. My name is Mandy Morton, and I am the People Operations Leader at Green Grove CPAs. I've spent most of my career in the corporate setting, and over the past year and a half, I've helped grow and develop our team here at Green Growth. Um, at Green Growth, we help cannabis companies increase their cash flow while staying compliant in this very regulated space. Um, it includes tax, accounting, outsource CFO, audit services, and more. So we're doing a ton in that financial space. Um, I think um, one thing I'd like to mention, I think many of us are breaking a stereotype here that this space is unprofessional. Um, this is a common response when I tell people what I do. I have to explain that this is a professional field with very professional people. So keeping mm-hmm. that conversation going is very important to me. And when we look at women in leadership positions, the numbers seem to be going the wrong way. Um, it makes sense. Big money starting to come in and take over the space and women run businesses have the potential to be pushed out. Um, in 2017, I think it was Forbes stated that there were 37% of executive level roles that were held by women. And today that percentage is like around 22%. Wow. Um, I believe it was ARCU, uh, National Cannabis Industry Report that came out that women in leadership roles are actually more profitable and produce more than twice the revenue per dollar invested than those without them. So it's smart for people to have women in leadership roles in this industry. And I think that being in an HR people ops role, um, I really want to ensure that women have a good place in the pipeline when we're recruiting. Um, a lot of times we hear, well, we can't put women or people of color in these senior positions because I don't have anybody in the pipeline. Um, I think that I'm in a position that can help make that happen. 
um, and we need to continue talking about it. Um, we, I think that this is a great platform and we should have more of these, more women panelists and more of us talking about women in the, in the cannabis industry. Um, so I love that we're here today. Um, I think one of the things that I wish I would have known coming into the cannabis industry is how hard we work. Um, we're very hard workers in this industry. It's a grind and a lot of us love what we do. So I think that coming into it, I um, was super optimistic and didn't expect how much work I was going to have to do, but it's been very, very worth it. Well, that's wonderful, Mandy. Thank you so much for sharing. And I love that you brought up some statistics because we're going to talk about that a little bit more um, in our presentation. So, um, and then let's see, let Sarah, can we hear from you from you next? Absolutely. And Wonderful. Mandy, thanks for dropping that uh, stat before. <laughs> and yes, that was from our white papers um, in collaboration with NCIA about women in the cannabis space. So I encourage everybody to check that out. But I'm Sarah Falvo. I'm Managing Director of Business Development over at Arcview Consulting. So that's just one of the verticals uh, within Arcview. Arcview has been around for almost 12 years. We were founded by Steve D'Angelo. And we were really founded on the basis of advocacy and access to capital. So back in the day, there weren't too many places where entrepreneurs in this space could go to get invest investment dollars. So we were essentially the platform. Things have morphed over the years and lots of pivots as everybody else has had to deal with. Um, so we do a number of things now. We also have a venture fund um, and our Women's Inclusion Network. So that is a great, community of nearly 250 women, um, all from different verticals of the cannabis and psychedelic industries. Um, many are investors themselves, many are entrepreneurs, and it's just a wonderful group where we share resources and mentorship and really try to get you know that capital into their hands and give them as many resources as possible. I personally have been in the cannabis space for almost five years at this point. Um, prior to that, I was doing nonprofit fundraising for museums and libraries, so it's definitely a very different pivot, but um, I always tell everybody, I will die on this cannabis hill. This industry is just what breathes life into me. I am an advocate at to my core for this plant, for access, and for the industry in general, so I'm just thrilled to be on this panel with an, a bunch of other amazing women and to chat cannabis today. Wonderful, Sarah. Thank you so much. And we're going to talk more about the Women's Inclusion Network later on. So thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, thank you, everyone, for the bit of knowledge and advice. I know we are all grateful for your insight. Uh, next, I'd like to move into a discussion with Cheryl from the Beverly Hills Cannabis Club. But before we get started, I wanted to read you a little bit of information about Cheryl. So Cheryl is the CEO and founder of the Beverly Hills Cannabis Club. Cheryl brings over 25 years of experience. She's built one of the largest cannabis media sources in the world with Kush Magazine. In 2010, as the director of celebrity media and public relations, Cheryl took them from 150,000 in gross revenues uh, to more than 6.5 million in revenue within 18 months. Known as the Martha Stewart of um, marijuana, Cheryl now manages a $100 million funding facility to invest in the cannabis sector, as well as a personal endorsement contracts with ancillary products in the cannabis industry. Now, I know this short bio doesn't fully cover everything Cheryl has been a part of and influenced in the business, but we're so excited to have her here and uh, get started. So. Cheryl, we want to learn more about you. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so very much. And as I had told you earlier, I'm always honored to be invited to things that support women in the sector. It is so uh, honorable and uh, I hope that I can help uh everyone learn as much as they need to, uh, do the right thing to, to, so that you get what you need. And uh, if anyone has any questions now, if you want to type them on the side there, um, I'm happy to answer your questions. And as we had talked about earlier, uh, if you want to try to reach me, you can also go and contact Danny. And I'm very easy to find. If you just type in my name, 
or the Martha Stewart of marijuana, which I feel is an insult to Martha Stewart. <laughs> but, you know, I've always wanted to just be known as myself. This is my name. This is what I do. But, you know, they got the media got tired of the Martha Stewart of marijuana because Snoop and Martha have their own show and they're really great at it. And I, I know both of them. They are amazing human beings. And I don't, I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. And tell me if you guys feel otherwise. But I don't like uh, putting this industry in as like a gimmick. It's not a mm -hmm. gimmick. I'm a mm -hmm. two-time cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. And that's why I became, when it saved my life, they told me I would, I would have no more than three days to live um, because I was pretty much eaten up with cancer. And, uh, you know, some people say it was a miracle. I, I don't believe that it was a miracle, which I think it's a good thing. But it really is the fact that cannabis and all the different endocannabinoids, it is true medicine. And at the same time, uh, cannabis can be used illicitly in the black market and you never know what you're getting. So thank God for the legalization of responsible adult use. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I like to say instead of, yeah, let's go get high. I mean, I really feel that the plant deserves all of our, uh, you know, recognition of the plant, paying honor to the plant. And there's so many things and so many endocannabinoids. And uh, just to round that uh, concept out, um, I studied with Dr. Raphael Mishulam, and I have been working with him now since 1992. And I had the very good fortune of working with the three billionaires that funded this outreach. And uh, we were able to, you know, make a lot of noise, but good noise about women being involved. And it was basically my daughter, and myself. And uh, I remember my youngest daughter, she smelled something funny one day in the house and she, she comes out because of course I was doing the typical mom thing of, having a joint that was prescribed to me from my doctor. I'd never even smoked a cigarette before. And uh, I just remember, oh my God. And these guys are calling me the Mark Stewart marijuana, the, the first lady of cannabis, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, look, let's just pay honor to the plant. Let's get some strong women who are single moms or divorced or young women that want to get into the sector. But I really wanted to focus on women and address all of them by their true names because these are the history makers. They are the game changers and they are the fastest growing sector. And then there were some hiccups that came along. And you know, one of the things I've learned by observing the field, so to speak, is that uh, these mistakes can be prevented. But you know, I've been in the industry for four decades now and I've learned a lot. And that's why I continue in my 60s to support people who want to get in the industry and be mentored. And I'll probably do it until the day I die. And it's the most beautiful and healing work I've ever done in my life. And Dr. Rafael Mashulam, if you guys look him up, he's in Israel and I have a home in Israel and I also have a a home in Malta and uh, that's kind of the center of the EU so and he is just amazing so I, I do suggest that you google him <laughs> and uh, he's a pistol I just love him to death I always say he's like the grandpa I always wanted never <laughs> had well, we'll yeah. have to put his information in the chat so people can so people can look him up and google him that would be great awesome well wonderful well Cheryl, so that kind of leads me into my next question. I wanted to ask you about how some of the stereotypes have really changed for women in the cannabis industry, but also how some of them are have stayed the same. And how, how do you see that coming into the future? Okay. Well, in the beginning of the movement, because there was a very distinct period between the, the cannabis, and I always like to, prefer to call it cannabis rather than weed or pot or anything else. And it's not that I'm a snob, but we really needed in those earlier days to show people this is a plant that can do so much and literally change the world. There is a, a saying in Israel, it's called Tikkun Olam, which means medicine to heal the world. And um, I, I'm just truly honored. So um, 
there's a number of things you would uh, ask me another question there. And uh, if you have anything else, please just throw it at me and I'll, I'll try to answer it as best I can. Wonderful. So, so Cheryl, in your experience, what are the typical pitfalls that women run into when running their own businesses? Are they different from men? The same? What do you think? The whole thing has changed. And then once we engaged in the media process and my celebrity friends coming in and being supportive, my investors coming in who were all closet cannabis people, and they put not only angel money, but hundreds of millions of dollars over the last several years to help build that infrastructure. However, the actual people working in the cannabis industry four decades ago were people like my friend Steve D'Angelo and so forth. But what I didn't like about the industry is I felt that they were being abusive to women because the, the original guys were mostly from the dark market. And not that I don't love them or respect them or anything, but the women that they had at the counters uh, helping them build their business, it was all black market. And then they would have the women be basically nude, except for the pasties over their nipples of their breasts. Mm -hmm. And I was mortified by that. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was certainly a sense of abuse. It was against everything that we were trying to build for right. women. And there was also a lot of, a lot of abuse back then. And because uh, cannabis wasn't truly legal yet at that point, you had a lot of the dark market coming in. They were lacing it with fentanyl and all kinds of bad mm -hmm. drugs. And uh, it killed a lot of people, which which those bad people are the ones that initially gave the cannabis sector a bad reputation. And that's why I felt it was so, so uh, needed to come in and change the course of what we're building because it's all... If you know who Pauline Sabin was, Pauline Sabin's, Sabin was the woman that got alcohol legalized and regulated because there were things with that that were loaded with God knows what kind of liquids. And again, people were dying. And uh, what I did at that point, the young ladies that were, um, I feel, being taken advantage of, they were not paid any money. They just got free cannabis. And, uh, but they had to be like half naked all the time. And a lot wow. of them were just trying to feed their children. And so what I did is every single young lady that I met, because I did a lot of work with the uh, emerging market, certainly, and helped build a lot of those companies, those women that I had met, the young women, I said, look, you don't have to do this. If you really want to take care of your child and, uh, you know, be at home to provide good child care, I will help you, you know? And I taught them everything. And basically we had a, not only a mentorship, but that's when it really started to become a movement. And uh, that just kept getting better and stronger. And I call it coming out of the, the glass closet, you know? And uh, it's been a miracle to watch. And I really hope that we can continue that dialogue. And like I said, anyone who has questions, you don't have to be a woman. You know, guys can contact me too. But the, the primary thing is I like for all of us to have the same vision and work goals and achieving those marks. Absolutely. So that was actually what I was going to um, talk to you a little bit about is you know, I'd love for our viewers to be able to hear about your mentorship program. And I think that, you know, obviously a lot of them could probably benefit from your services. And then maybe we have some, you know, very successful ladies turning in today that maybe want to be mentors for other, um, you know, women coming up in the industry. So can you tell us how to, you know, what the project or the program entails? Well, the first thing is, you know, I don't like feeling like I have to sell someone on cannabis, you know, getting involved in the movement. When people contact me, what I need to hear is what their past is, what they're doing now, and why are they contacting me to get into the industry. So they're really going to need to feel confident enough because I get thousands of requests almost every day around the world, and I do work in the international market. And uh, that is very important to me. So if someone calls me and, and says, like, dude, 
I like to mix my marijuana with cocaine. <laughs> like, no, no, no. You got to go. You got to go now. Not, your, <laughs> not, a, not a fit. God bless. Not your you. arena. <laughs> yeah. And and that was the biggest thing. And and I, again, when they say, hey, let's go smoke a joint. Let's go do some pot, whatever it is. Again, and I hope I don't sound like a snob. But as I had said earlier, it's very important to respect the plant because it's saved so many lives since it's really emerged and come out of the dark. I couldn't agree more, Cheryl. That absolutely excellent. Well, well, thank you so much, Cheryl. I, I look forward to talking to you more later on and um, continuing to follow up with you. And I just appreciate you um, sharing some of your insight with us and enlightening us. Um, it's just been such a pleasure to speak with you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. And thanks to everyone that is tuned in for this. We need more of you. And feel free to come out of the closet and let's do this. Let's do it well. That's great, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, let's, let's, look at, let's look at the chat real quick and see if we have any questions that um, Jim, <laughs> that we should pause to answer right now. See, I don't see anything in it. People are very excited about your um, your mentorship program, Cheryl. So I'm sure everybody will reach out. If, if you didn't hear, the information to contact Cheryl is in the uh, chat, or sorry, in the description of the YouTube video. If not, please reach out to us and we'll get you in contact with her. But Danny, go ahead and move forward with your next thing. Wonderful. Thank you, Jim. All right, let's move forward with our next panelist. So next, I'd like to bring up Safita Artist Mills from the National Cannabis Party. Hi, Hello. Hi, Hi. Dan. So the, we're going to be chatting about the current political barriers, the upcoming legislation, how more women and minorities can get involved and have their voices heard. Mm -hmm. um, but first, I want to start with a little background about you, Safita. So um, I'm going to read your bio here. Safita is the co-founder and president of the National Cannabis Party. She began her journey with, with the cannabis industry over five years ago, developing disruptive technology that would address issues of consumer safety and compliance in the space. She co-founded Cannamark USA along with Redmond and Damon Jackson. Her background has always been in the technology and gaming sectors in which she's been able to bring her skill set into cannabis with the innate ability to quickly build and cultivate relationships. Like she said, she is a proud Canna mom and caregiver to her four-year-old daughter, who is a heart, trans heart transplant recipient that was born with a congenital heart disease, CHD. As a strong believer in the plant and all of its medicinal properties, she has used cannabis to treat her daughter and improve her quality of life. This is one of the many reasons she has been an advocate for patient access and the right to choose cannabis as their medicine. Safita has spent over a decade advocating for social programs and equal access to opportunities in, the, in tech for black and brown communities. And now she's bringing the fight to social, or excuse me, she's bringing the fight for equity empowerment to cannabis. So Safita, thank you for being here today. Let's jump right into, right into the questions. All right. So as many of us have observed in the cannabis industry, it's obviously very male dominated. How is that impacting the participation of women in writing legislation? Um, I feel that uh, women have a different perspective. And I think that there needs to be more women uh, involved in that process. Not saying that there aren't any, but I feel having women involved that not only come from cannabis, but understand um, a lot of these barriers to entry in the space and how legislation is going to be helpful in making sure that women have a voice in cannabis, especially those uh, who are moms that may be canna moms, that may just be moms who are caregivers and they have children and they're a little canna curious. So I think there needs to be more women whose voices are amplified in this space that has something different to bring um, to the conversation because a lot of the time you may see the same people or the you know the same um, elected officials that are representing a community or a specific group and they may not understand 
um, certain aspects of, you know, advocacy or, you know, right. access to medicine or just opportunities for women as a whole and what barriers they may face, even just having children or being caregivers for children who have um, severe illnesses and how that may impact how they're able to enter the space. So I feel that there needs to be more uh, women involved and there needs to be more push in the, from the men in the industry to also help amplify women's voices in the political space as well. Yeah, Safita, that's great. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I want to ask you a little bit about what are your, your thoughts on the long-term consequences of women being left out of these early conversations? I think the long-term consequences are um, is just the lack of representation and um, the lack of opportunity to provide real resources. Uh, if women are left out of this conversation and not allowed to be able to bring uh, insight that can be extremely impactful and that could really change things um, for the better within the industry and also improve communities, I think that it can slow down the progress for cannabis as a whole. I think that uh, from a political standpoint, there are, there's a lot of conversation that happens and not as much action or movement that's really going to determine how we change the course of action when it comes to legislation, when it comes to policies that are going to be put in place. It's going to affect uh, communities for a long period of time, especially uh, when you're talking about laws that are created that are not as easy to undo as regulations. So I feel that we have to ensure that women do have a seat at the table and that they're able to voice um, themselves, that they're able to bring insight into the conversation that's not really being addressed or spoken of. And I think as a woman, just understanding just certain uh, situations that we may endure that others don't, especially as moms, we have a lot more that we have to maneuver around. We have children and it's not always welcoming. And in this space, it I am happy to see that some women um, have have made it a point to make sure that other women are, um, you know, getting those opportunities and that they're, they don't feel like they're not welcome because they are a mom or they do have all these other, you know, responsibilities that others may not have to think of. So I think it's very, very important for us to be not only a part of that conversation, but be a part of the solution in creating the right regulation and the right mm -hmm. legislation that's going to ensure that the industry is done the right way. Absolutely. So that being said, what are you, what are your current thoughts on the current legislation on the docket to federally legalize cannabis? Um, it, it's it's like a mixed bag of emotions <laughs> <I think it's laughs> when it comes to that because it's like, you know, you got the War Act and then you have the Senate who has their own bill. And I feel that both just have, they have to meet in the middle somewhere. Right. I, as hopeful as we are for the More Act to pass, we also understand there's another bill on the table that's from the Senate. So do we really expect the Senate to pass a bill that's proposed by the House and vice versa? So I think that it should be a collective effort and there should be one bill that's contributed by both sides to where they can come to an agreement and and make sure that they, they're able to take something from each other and, and build the best bill that's also going to, you know, serve the people and the community first and foremost, because there is no industry without the people. So right. if the people aren't participating, if patients aren't um, using cannabis for their medicine, if there aren't people doing the clinical research and, and coming out with these, you know, incredible white papers and studies that show just all the amazing things that cannabis does, we wouldn't have, it wouldn't exist. And it definitely wouldn't exist without the advocates and women who have been on the front lines from the beginning, pushing for this and even uprooting their entire families to move to welcoming mm -hmm. states because they needed to use cannabis, um, you know, for their children or even, you know, for, for someone else in their family. So I feel like it, it, they have to come to some type of um, middle ground. And until that happens, I'm not sure where the tug of war is going to end between both bills. Right. Well, which countries do you think are getting it right right now in terms of legalization? Is there any that really stand out to you? Um, I think for me, I, I've been paying uh, pretty close attention to Uruguay and Chile. 
Um, okay. As far as research goes, I'm I'm really amazed by all that's being done in Israel. Um, a lot of the research that I had done just in deciding in what to use for my daughter and just even understanding the endocannabinoid system more and how different cannabinoids affect the body and different mm -hmm. conditions. And it was just, it just opened my eyes to so much that, you know, we don't always get access to. And I feel that when you see countries like Israel doing that kind of research and doing that kind of work, there needs to be collaboration. That's something that I champion a lot in conversations that I've had in multiple panels is that we need to work together. And if we see those countries who are getting it right, we should be talking to them. We should right. be collaborating with them. We should be bringing that research here because there are, um, like the UK, for example, they're able, doctors are able to prescribe cannabis and we're not quite there yet, but even working with the country who's already doing that, that can help us figure out how we can get that incorporated into, you know, medical programs and, you know, with doctors and medical professionals here so that patients can have real consultations and be able to get recommendations that's going to help them based on what specific condition that they have. Yeah, Safita, I think you're completely right. I, I mean, we need to look at who's already doing a good job and go from there. Um, Let's see. So how I wanted to ask you, how is the work you're doing right now helping women and minorities impacted by the war on drugs? Um, the, I would say that the work that I'm doing now is shedding light on um, some things that I feel isn't talked about enough, specific issues. Um, just recently, um, I had the honor and pleasure of introducing a bill that um, I co-wrote with the New York State Senate, Senator James Sanders. Um, for the Cannabis Community Reinvestment Act, which uh, puts accountability on, you know, MSOs and different cannabis operators to be able to give back and to reinvest in communities who have been um, impacted most and that it has the least amount of opportunities in this space. So not just leaving it up to tax revenue, but actually getting cannabis businesses involved with community reinvestment and working together with the community to make sure that there are fair and equitable opportunities and that there is proper education in getting people, um, you know, infiltrated into the industry in a way where we set them up for success and not set them up for failure. A lot of the time with licensing, once a person is awarded a license, that's when the real work begins. And unfortunately, some people don't keep their licenses because they either have a lack of capital, they may not have you know, operating procedures in place, and they just may not understand what the process is fully. So I feel that mm -hmm. education is, is a huge um, undertaking, and that is very necessary in making sure that when we're bringing people into the industry, that we're setting them up to succeed and that we're empowering them in a way that's going to really rebuild stronger communities, especially those that have been impacted most. Yeah, I think I totally agree. I mean, that's why we do a lot of these videos is to provide educational resources for the cannabis community. So I couldn't agree more that that's a lot of what we need for people. Um, let's see, I just wanna finish up here with one last question. So as a canna mom, a businesswoman and a caregiver, what advice uh, can you give to other women interested in pursuing a professional career in cannabis? Um, I would say to definitely uh, find your tribe and find people who will be a great um, resource for support and, uh, and don't be afraid to ask for help, especially when you're a mom trying to navigate this space and balance so many things. There are people who will help you and that can help you understand how to be able to um, to to provide that balance and and even point you in the right direction because you don't have to come into this space alone and you can come in here and create whatever opportunity you want. And even if that means empowering other women who needs your skill set or your expertise. So I would say definitely find a, a, a great support system and, and the resources that you will need from that support system is going to help set you up for success. Wonderful, that's great. Well. Safita, thank you so much for sharing all of those insights on the cannabis political landscape with our viewers today. We really appreciate your perspective and expertise in this area. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, well, let's see, now sounds like a good time to take a look at our chat. Um, so
All right. So we do have one question from Jess here, and Jess is uh, part of Green Growth CPAs. She asks, how do women in a male-dominated companies assert themselves more to begin changing the stigma and make themselves a part of it, a part of this industry? So how do you kind of put yourself into there and, and, and ask, you know, demand that you get into this industry? Anybody want to jump in on that one? All right, sure. Okay. Um, I love men and women and, and, and puppies, of course. This is Billy, by the way. Um, <laughs> one of the things that, that is the most important thing, and I failed at this initially. Um, in the industry that I'd worked with at that time, it was mostly celebrities, anyone from Michael Jackson to Elton John to, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of them. I, since I was 17, uh, I had started working with celebrities online. But uh, here was the thing. Um, I've seen a lot of times, and again, there's some wonderful men in the world, there's some wonderful women, and a mix and match of all of this. So I don't want to sound like I'm a snob or whatever. But um, the most important thing that I've learned from my entire life's work in cannabis is to get stuff in writing. I made the mistake of when people were contacting me, especially people that wanted to invest in the money. You know, I was used to saying, you know, like to my celebrity clients, don't worry about it. I trust you. We've been, we've known each other for years, not worried about getting paid, you know, but what will happen a lot of times, if you get someone who's unethical, they will work you to death. And guess what? Because you didn't sign something, you're not going to make a penny. And most of the time, young women specifically, they don't have the money to fight in court. And back then it was a very limited amount of women at all in the industry. And that's why um, I just pushed harder and harder and harder. And, you know, you do have to uh, kind of stand out the crowd and you, de you do need to know what your value is as a human being. You do need to be proud of your work and what you're building. And, uh, the other thing that I think is very, very important, and look, I'm usually around in my slippers and my jeans and a t-shirt, but when you are representing your work as into the industry, I do think it is very important to uh, respect yourself and show yourself that you are not only a cannabis person anymore or someone that enjoys cannabis, you are a professional woman working in the greatest field in the world, so to speak. And there are so many ways that you can serve. But, but the most important thing, as I've said before, get things in writing and chances are you are not going to have anything to work from because it's such a new industry. And that's why you need to find a great mentor or something. But watch out, cover your back, because a lot of the people, not the black market people are bad, but some of them are just like white people or Indian people or people of color and a, a whole mix in between. Because I personally am a mutt. You know, you can find a little bit of anything with me. But, um, you know, like I remember, you know, I used to wear a lab coat all the time. And people would say, why are you wearing a lab coat? And I'm like, because I was working in the laboratory, you know, with um, endocannabinoid medicine, and I want to make sure I do everything right. And this is a medical, a true medical um, thing that I'm working with. And it took, that's what it started to take, especially working with other women. And I think initially when a lot of those first younger women got into the sector, they were like a lot of people, including me, who made mistakes back then because I was so used to growing up with, you know, your word is your bond. Uh, your word is as good as a written contract. Well, you know something? No. We need something in writing. And do not budge. And be very, very careful because what's happening over and over and over again is the fact that almost all women, I would say as many as 90%, have been treated very poorly. They've been paid very little. And a lot of people that were in charge of that sort of thing, they just run them to death and then they burn out. And I just want you to know that every single human being is valued in this world. But you also have to stand up for yourself. 
And, you know, that's why I like to work with young women and young men and, and even older people, because, because again, I'm, I'm in my 60s now. But there are so many opportunities. Just make sure you cover yourself and start to build your own circle of support, patients, and also other colleagues that are good people, educated in the sector and helping other women build their destiny. Yeah, that's, that's wonderful advice, Cheryl. Thank you so much. Definitely want to build out your tribe and, and get things in writing. Right. So perfect. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. We're going to move on with our next panelist discussion. So uh, the next panelist I'd like to bring up is Green Growth's very own People Operations Leader, Mandy Morton. So thank you for being here today, Mandy, and doing this event with me. Thank you, Danny. I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. So first, I want to start with a little bit of background about Mandy. Um, Mandy is responsible for the HR policies and change management initiatives at Green Growth. Um, she, excuse me, her hands-on experience uh, leading HR and change management initiatives includes driving employee engagement during times of change, workforce planning and development, and process engineering. With over 10 years of experience in the human resources division, Mandy is a key driver in overseeing the growth and development of the Green Growth team. Mandy believes the key to success is through constructing and maintaining an employee first culture. And you definitely do that for us, Mandy. So thank you. Um, let's see. So I want to jump in and um, dive right into your questions. So I want to spend a little bit of time with you going over transferable skills. Uh, that's definitely a hot point for women and people in general uh, wanting to enter into the cannabis workforce. So tell me, Mandy, what are the types of transferable skills that you look for and why? Great question. Um, I know that it's different for each cannabis company, the roles they're like what we're all trying to fill. Um, but at Green Growth, we do look for specific experience. Um, for accounting, we want somebody that's been doing it for a while. Like they could do it in their sleep and they're just looking for something new. Um, that's where the cannabis industry comes in and it's appealing for candidates and it's something new to learn. They get new clients to interact with, and it's just an overall in interesting industry to experience. Um, I also look for strong team players. You know that someone that will enhance and support our current team. Um, you definitely want to bring people in that are going to be strong, so you're not um, damaging any culture positive um, space that you have in your your current organization. Um, now, for plant touching roles, employers may look for people in agriculture, pharmaceutical, food and beverage, retail. Um, for example, pharmaceutical professionals understand the need for spot on inventory and candidates with retail experience, they have the ability to enhance your customer service. So they really know how to treat people when they're coming into a dispensary. Um, one point I would like to make is that many of us are coming from other industries or corporate roles. The adult use industry is still so young. That means that many of us, um, other than Cheryl, have made huge career shifts very recently in our careers. So my advice to candidates is just be genuine when you're talking to employers and you're talking to those HR teams. Um, tell them why you want to join the industry and don't let your lack of experience define you. Wonderful. So if somebody was interested in joining the industry, um, where should they be looking? Can you give some like great ideas to some people that maybe either want to get into the industry or maybe they got their foot in, but they're kind of looking for something else, but they want to stay in cannabis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, LinkedIn is a cannabis friendly space, which is it's not restricted like other social medias. So you can find cannabis jobs. You can find a lot of content out there. Um, so, but you can really go anywhere. So you can go on Indeed and find those cannabis jobs as well. So okay. where you would find a, a, a non-cannabis job, go there and you could probably find a cannabis job too. Um, but if you're looking for specific platforms, there are ones set up that are cannabis job boards. You can try banks or flower hire, but there are a ton out there. So just do a quick Google search and you'll find, you'll find them. Um, but my advice is always to start networking, locate advocates in your area or start with the people on this panel. Find us on LinkedIn, connect with us, watch what we're posting on social media, especially places like LinkedIn where we share those job opportunities, but just kind of watch, see what's going on and, and then start chiming in and start looking for the postings that we're putting out there and apply for them. Yeah, awesome. I think being becoming part of the conversation is the first step a lot of times. So. 
Well, wonderful, Mandy. That was excellent. Um, we're going to get to some more questions with you in a little bit, but I want to uh, thank you for sharing your insights on the cannabis employment sector with our viewers today. And we really appreciate your time and expertise in this area. Thank you so much, Danny. Wonderful. All right. Yep, there are no more questions here, so you can just move on to the next panelist for Sarah here. Wonderful. All right. So to round out the discussion, we're going to bring up our final panelist, Ms. Sarah Falvo. So hi, Sarah. Hey, Danny. So I'm going to start with a little background on Sarah. Sarah is the Managing Director of Business Development at ArcView. <laughs> Consult at Arcview Consulting. Um, let's see, she has been in the cannabis industry for nearly five years and thrives on facilitating connections that will steward the industry at a time of rapid growth by aligning interests, people, and values toward a co common goal. Her prior experience in, has afforded her the opportunity to work with many companies of varying sizes, including MSOs, public and private entities as well. Additionally, she has experience working for a cannabis fund for which included reviewing hundreds of cannabis deals and pitches. And she has been instrumental in running due diligence on a number of prospective investment opportunities. So thank you for being here, Sarah. Thank you. Uh, we're, yeah, we're happy to have you on our round table today celebrating uh, 420. So I wanna just start by picking off the questions and just asking you, um, you know, how women in particular, but also the general public can get funding for their cannabis businesses. Um, so aside from, you know, the basics, such as like a pitch deck and financial projections, what are the specific hurdles, um, you know, that women are facing and that public is facing in general? Absolutely. So, you know, a lot of the times people have an idea on a napkin and that is wonderful. You know, you need to start somewhere but it's really all the steps afterwards to solidify your plan is the most important thing. So, you know, what problem are you solving? What markets are you going after? What are your expansion strategies? And in the end, what are your exit strategies as well? So everything from A to Z is what someone needs to know before they start asking for money. And specifically, you know, for women, what I find and what I've been hearing and seeing over and over is that we tend to not ask for enough. And it's a very stark difference between women who are fundraising in this space and men who are fundraising in this space. And one of our um, members a few weeks ago said something like, may you have what is the confidence of a 30 year old tech bro raising money you know <laughs> and that honestly i know it's a little crass but it's actually true you know a lot of these times these younger predominantly white men who are fundraising have a lot of confidence with nothing to back it up and they have no issues asking for exorbitant amounts of money again, with nothing kind of on paper or no traction or anything like that. So it's interesting that we kind of shy away from being so confident in what we have and we ask for the lesser number. So it's a lot of what I do and what's important to me is really empowering these women with confidence too. Mm -hmm. And I think that all starts with feeling like you're not alone. So really having a community and allies in the space where you mm -hmm. can talk to, that you can bounce ideas off, that you can practice pitches with, and you can find those. And it's really just about being open and asking for help as well. And I, I think, you know, Safita said it earlier, like people will help you. So don't be afraid to ask. And so many times I get on the phone with a lot of women all the time just to give them advice and, you know, have them bounce ideas off of me and give them my opinion. So I think really just building that community to gain the confidence to ask what you actually need for because you don't want to make fundraising a full-time job you know you want that money and then you want to go run the business that you're yeah, trying you to run mm -hmm. yeah i mean i was a professional fundraiser for 15 years in the nonprofit sector and i don't recommend fundraising to anyone <laughs> so you know it's one of those things but i would absolutely say ask for more money you know okay. know that number know that number wonderful that's great advice definitely 
So um, let's see, in your opinion, what are the most common pitfalls you see businesses unknowingly come across when seeking investor-based funding for their cannabis operation? Absolutely. So knowing your expansion plan. So investors are looking to make a return on their investment. You know, mm -hmm. of course, there's a lot of more who are thoughtful and want to help, you know, push the industry forward and things like that. But for the most part, investors are looking for a return. So mm -hmm. you as a company really need to figure that out. And again, that goes back to what I just said before, like, what are your expansion plans? What happens when this becomes federally legal? What, mm -hmm. you know, what's that kind of green light switch that you're going to do to get those numbers, to get those customers, to do all of those things. So to really have that plan sussed out from A to Z. And I know it's, it's, it's kind of counteractive because I mean, everything is changing every day in this industry yeah. all the time so like planning that's like a joke but <laughs> on paper you should have some idea of your growth and also again that exit because mm -hmm. they will be asking you what does that look like do you want to be acquired do you want to just keep going with it so again just having all of that planned out planning 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 you know and as much as you have to pivot at least at least you have that kind of baseline to go off of Awesome. Well, um, I'm already a part of it, but I wanted to say for our viewers, I want you to tell me and everyone about WIN. Absolutely. So WIN is our Women's Inclusion Network. And this essentially started about a year and a half ago, and it was spun off of this need for a community for women in the space. So our few, were, we were doing quarterly conferences. We would have a lunch for the women in the room. Unfortunately, like five years ago, it was only a few women. And then right before the pandemic, we had almost 100 women at the luncheon. And the feedback was that they just wanted more. They wanted more time for connections, more mentorship and all of that. So we formally launched this into a membership group that has a lower price point than, you know, what traditionally it costs to become an ARCU member. And we really focus um, on mentorship, access to capital, access to C-suite roles, and access to board suite, uh, board seats. So we do all of this by offering mentorship, resources, education, research, all that jazz, all the stuff that ARCQ is known for, specifically for women. So it's a wonderful group. There's almost 250 women from all verticals um, across the U.S. and in Canada. And I just love it. It really, you know, this is what keeps me going and this is what what makes me tick. Well, that's great. Well, I, I love being a part of it too. Um, I love the mentor workshops. I think my favorites have been the meditation one and the dispensary design one. Those were yeah. both very cool. And I love that you guys do all different ones to be able to connect with, <coughs> excuse me, women in different parts of um, the industry, depending on whatever vertical that they're in. Absolutely. And it's really easy to be siloed in what you're doing in the space. So that's what we want to give. We want to give that holistic view. We want mm -hmm. you to have access to all the different verticals and what's going on, because that's only going to make you a more successful entrepreneur and or investor as well. Well, wonderful. Well, um, now I want to loop in the other panelists um, and I want you to be able to share some information about your upcoming events. So um, why did our choose to have their first in-person event with COVID uh, specifically designed for women in Canada? Absolutely. So this Women's Inclusion Network has been one of our most successful, just anecdotally, um, groups and things that we've launched. The energy, the connections, and all of the women who are in it are just so amazing that we really wanted this to be a celebration. And we knew that if we launched it as our Women's Inclusion Network event, we have all these wonderful, wonderful mm -hmm. members who are so committed to this group that there would be enough to fill the room and make it a successful event. And we're already selling tickets very fast. We're gonna have um, pitch competitions as well. Um, there's going to be a lot of investors um, as well as entrepreneurs at this. Um, so it's 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 going to be a celebration of all things women in cannabis, which I'm so excited about. Well, that's fantastic, uh, Sarah. Thank you so much for sharing the information about that event. So um, thank you for everyone for sharing your experience with our viewers today. Um, I've loved hearing from everybody and just can't get enough. Um, so before we wrap up today, um, 
I want to see if there's any final questions that we have uh, from the chat and then just kind of put a few um, outlying last questions out for our panelists. Jim, is there anything that we need to look at in the chat? No more questions in the chat. Uh, everything is good. Go ahead with what you have prepared. All right, wonderful. So today we've talked about some of the biggest challenges women are facing in the cannabis industry. We've also discussed some of the greatest opportunities for women to get involved in. But I want to hear from some of our viewers. I want to hear from some of you ladies. Like, what are your inspirational goal and inspirational goals? Like, what are things that we can help you with, and how can we, you know, help each other? Uh, I guess I'll go first. All right. Um, one of my inspirational goals is to um, help create a clinical research study program for pediatric patients. I feel that there's not enough. Um, research done and that there needs to be specific programs that focuses on children and um, cannabis and, and coming up a way with a way to microdose cannabis for children because um, just from my own experience, I watched doctors uh, microdose medication that was only specifically tailored for adults for children as young as just several days old. So I felt if they could microdose um, these pharmaceutical medications for children, then the same can be done for cannabis. So I'm hoping to um, help develop and create a program and partner with uh, children's hospitals, pediatricians, just different uh, medical professionals and specialists that specifically care for children. Um, and especially those that are uh, dealing with different chronic illnesses and um, conditions. Awesome. That's very, very moving, Safita. That's so cool. Um, let's see. Does anybody else have anything that they want to talk about that we can rally behind? Cheryl? Um, one of the things I just want to be real quick is that I'm sure some of you have heard about an elevator pitch. So mm -hmm. one of the things that you should start doing right away is you get two minutes to close a deal when you're working with someone who's a true investor, who has a lot of experience and doesn't waste time. So I feel like you have to always be ready to do your two minutes. Sometimes you only get one minute. But if you do that and you know exactly what you're going to say and it's smooth, I also urge you to you know, literally present this to yourself while you're on the screen so you can see what you look like and sound like to someone you're trying to pitch and close. Okay. That's very, very important. And always be ready to produce because sometimes you'll be, be on a flight. Sometimes you'll be in a restaurant and don't feel bad about approaching someone. If you see someone that you recognize or you think that you could help you, go ahead and just stand uh, and see them and say, look, I'm a huge fan of your work. I'm very interested in the industry. I've been working. I've got a great little two minute presentation. I would love to have the opportunity to present it to you sometime and, and give your uh, dealing points, have a contract ready because you need to be ready to go at any time moment. And believe me, if you don't, there will be someone taking your place in a heartbeat. Well, I think that is great business advice, Cheryl. I mean, you know, whatever industry you're in, whatever business you're in, a two minute elevator pitch is necessary for everyone. So I think that is some great business advice and a great place for us to stop today. Does anybody else have any final thoughts that they want to share with our viewers and leave them with before we finish up today? Just that there's room in the industry for everyone. So we welcome you. The more people, the better. That's fantastic, Sarah. Danny, real quick, somebody had asked a question about um, getting into the cannabis industry um, from the accounting side. Um, I do think that it is like really just do like blast uh, application process to try to get in. But there are a ton of educational programs out there um, here in Ohio, we have the Cleveland School of Cannabis. It's one of the most famous cannabis uh, marijuana colleges in the U.S. Um, they have a, a campus in Cleveland and in Columbus, and they have like six certification programs, one of them being um, business and accounting. So look into the education out there. Some of these programs are free. Um, and then the other ones range from like three hundred to thirteen thousand dollars. So just check into the programs, get educated. Um, again, not everyone in the industry is 
educated specifically in cannabis, but as it continues to grow and these educational programs come out, um, the people that take advantage of them could potentially get um, better access to jobs. So just check into everything that's out there. Wonderful, Mandy. That's great advice. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to all of our viewers today. Thank you to each of our lovely panelists for joining us and spending your 420 lunch hour with us. We hope you enjoyed the event. And if there's any questions we didn't get to because of time constraints, I'm so sorry. Uh, my deepest apologies, but definitely to learn more about our presenters and their companies and the services we offer, we'll make sure that all of their contact information is down in the uh, description of the YouTube video. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us today. Uh, please make sure you visit each of these ladies' information and uh, reach out to them. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Danny. Bye. Bye.